Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hello, I'm your co-host, Marcus Bauman, a senior research scientist at IHMC. Joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Marcus. Good to be here. Dr. Mark Hamilton is a professor of health and human performance at the University of Houston and is an expert in muscle physiology. His laboratory has conducted basic and applied research in both animal models and humans to identify and test strategies for disease prevention across the lifespan. Mark and his lab have long worked to understand the impact of a sedentary lifestyle in general and of sitting in particular. Our listeners have shown great interest in a paper he published in the journal Eye Science, which introduces the soleus push-up. We will discuss this important research in some detail. But first, we have some housekeeping to take care of. We are grateful to all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker SciFan1972. Thank you again, STEM Talk, for sharing thoughtful and thought-provoking conversations with us. Recent episodes with Don Lehman and Judith Curry were great discussions filled with valuable insights. Keep up the great work. Thank you, SciFan1972, and thanks to all other listeners who have helped STEM Talk become such a great success. And now on to our interview with Dr. Mark Hamilton. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, everyone. This is Marcus Bauman, Senior Research Scientist and Director of Healthspan Resilience and Performance at IHMC, sitting in as a co-host today with Dr. Ken Ford. Excited to interview and, and talk about the latest research with Dr. Mark Hamilton at University of Houston today. Well, Marcus, this uh, will be an interesting interview, and uh, let's get right to it. Sounds great. So, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to, to speak to you. So today, Mark, you're considered an expert in muscle physiology, focused on solving some of the most difficult problems of metabolism and biochemistry. But our listeners would like to know a little bit more about your early life. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up, which I understand is about 90 minutes outside of Houston. How would you describe your childhood? It was a utopia for a young boy in Texas at the time. I, I thoroughly enjoyed my childhood. It was a rural county, a lot of farming, still is. It, it, fortunately, it hasn't changed that much since this many years ago. But um, I had a, a, a lot of opportunity for doing things with a little bit more independence than even kids back in the day. And as a result of that, I think it helped me as a scientist because oftentimes as a, as a, in science, you're trying to do things, hopefully, uh, depends on the kind of science you do, but you're trying to do things, hopefully, that sometimes are uncharted and there's not a blueprint for. So it was a good childhood for that. It sounds like it. Would you say that your affinity for the real world kinds of problems that you work on began in some way with your involvement in your childhood with hunting and studying animal behavior and learning in a very hands-on way about anatomy and the physiology of animals? Yeah, I definitely would think so because, you know, there's that, there's that curiosity that I think that is certainly not unique to our times, but it's always been a human characteristic that we, we see things and we want to figure it out. And I think that one of the interesting things about looking at animals specifically in, in comparative physiology and fields like that is that we can learn an awful lot about some very fundamental principles by looking closely at some of the special characteristics that different animals possess. And we oftentimes forget that in, in human research, while there's a need to, to try to generalize and describe things in, in a way that, that is helpful for sort of the immediate clinical setting, we oftentimes might lose sight of some powerful breakthroughs that are out there that are sitting under our nose all along. 
and we just don't pay attention to it. And hopefully we have time to, to discuss that a little bit more this as we talk today, because certainly in my own research, it's it's a good illustration of something that has been right in front of us for, for many years, but nobody had bothered to even see it. You know, it's interesting. A real world comparative biology experience is just so enriching for a kid. What else did you do for fun as a child? Did you, you know, have any hobbies or sports? Yeah, I, I was definitely into a variety of sports at different stages in life. And like a lot of young boys, you know, it's your job. Sometimes you take it on with gusto, which develops not only discipline, but like I described before, sometimes independence. If you want to get good at something, it doesn't necessarily always take place in a formalized type of setting. You you might not, for example, have competitive sports or coaching in, in, in the sports that you might be interested in doing. And, and you just, you figure it out. You find your way to improve as much as you individually can. And I still, to this day, enjoy that about exercise, for example. I'm pushing 60 now and I still train as hard as I did when I was 15. I enjoy that very much. I think that one thing that's probably true with most people who do something related to exercise physiology is that that they want to know how their own body works and that might have led them into the field and it, it's okay it's there's nothing it's nothing selfish about trying to figure out how your body works i think that's a great way to think yeah i think that's a really important driver for a lot of people in the field you didn't go to college though with the idea of becoming a scientist so what did you have in mind when you actually started your undergraduate studies at the University of Texas, Austin? Yeah, the, I was probably like a lot of kids. that I, I, I had not been mentored or, or, or told about different career paths. I was fortunate to, to be able to go to a school like University of Texas. And at the time, this was quite a few years ago, but it, was, it was still had the, the, what we sometimes call in, in modern academics sort of an old school approach to university where there weren't as many established requirements for a certain degree plan. And even if you were a science major, they encourage you to get a BA instead of a BS. And you, know, you could you could explore different topics. And then that way you're taking things that you're truly interested in at that moment. And so I, I did that. And I, I frankly didn't ever really envision graduate school and certainly a life as a scientist until, you know, several years into my training. I was probably almost a senior as an undergraduate when I started to even think about graduate school. But the good news for me was that I had been doing all those things that probably would be ideal for preparing. So in other words, I, I had by that stage amassed a couple of file cabinets of journal articles and I didn't do it for classes. I didn't do it because I thought I would have a profession. It was just, it was very interesting to read journal articles. And remember this was, this was back when we had Xerox copiers for a nickel uh, a page. We didn't have computers to download PDFs. And so you would sit in the stacks of the library and read journals, much like you read a book. And you'd go through and say, I'm going to get through an issue today and I'll pick it up and read another issue tomorrow. And you see rocks the ones that you like the most. So we've kind of lost that. It's unfortunate that with the massive number of journals that are published and high availability, I don't think many, even even when I talk to my peers or scientists, they rarely take much time to to sit down and just read through an entire article. They're looking for something when they read a paper. They're looking for a, something that might help provide a reference for something they're writing or skimming skimming titles and topics. And a lot's lost in science when you when you don't actually enjoy the process of learning. Yeah, I'd say we're we're of similar age, and and I remember those days and value those days as well. Just in the basement of the library near the copier with volumes of the Journal of Applied Physiology or other journals. Was there something in particular in your zoology undergrad training that led you to say, hey, I want to do a master's in exercise physiology? Was there a particular study that sparked you? No, there really wasn't. <laughs> this is kind of a humorous thing to look back at. It's maybe a little insulting too, but I don't mean it to be. I didn't even know there was a department of exercise physiology or exercise science on campus. And uh, I had not taken a class in it. I had uh, was totally unfamiliar that there were, there were people actually studying that on campus. And you think I would have known that, but I, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't have. And it happened to be that there was a doctoral student of Ed Coyles who, uh, Andy Coggin, and he's had a good career of his own. And he was looking for endurance trained cyclists for 
his own dissertation and he needed people who were willing to commit to giving him a bunch of biopsies and blood samples. And I thought that was fantastic. And so it really, you know, once I was a, in their lab, then uh, it became pretty clear, pretty quick that this was something that I had a, a big interest in. So, Mark, please share a little bit about what you like most about grad school, particularly as you pursued your Ph.D. at University of South Carolina. Well, I had a a very fortunate and unusual situation there as well. I went there to get a degree in in exercise physiology, and I did. Actually, I did all of my research for my dissertation in another department, uh, working with a professor who, who didn't study exercise. And he was actually trained as an engineer, but but did a lot of, of work with a model to study fluid balance, specifically transcapillary fluid balance. And, and it involved a massive amount of, of surgery techniques that I got to learn. And it, I enjoyed it because he was extremely good at trying to think through processes that required oftentimes modeling and when you're trying to study how stuff gets in and out of capillaries, it's, it's pretty fundamental to any tissue. No tissue can live without it. We oftentimes talk about hormones and substrate delivery and whatnot, but that we, we lose sight of the fact that you just can't deliver something in the blood to a tissue and then it hops out. It's, it's, there's actually a capillary wall there that has to get through and vice versa. Things have to get back out. And you, you can't see these things microscopically. You have to infer what's there, but we, we had techniques that were able to provide very definitive types of transcapillary flux of molecules. So it was great for me. It was, a, like I said, a lots of hands-on surgery, learning how to think about processes that others were not studying or could not study. And unfortunately, that whole field is now shriveled up. There's nobody left alive on earth that, that actually even understands those concepts anymore. Back in the 20s through the 50s and even into the 60s, there were people winning Nobel Prizes in this. It was a hot area of science, but for a variety of reasons, not due to lack of importance, but just uh, mm. lack of not fitting sort of the molecular biology world, n- not fitting, uh, you know, cure a disease tomorrow quickly with a new pharmaceutical or new nutritional trick. That type of fundamental research is not done. Mm. That's a, a shame in my view. Oh, it's a, it's an amazing shame. I mean, like I said a second ago, just imagine that every single thing that you eat or drink or every molecule that has to get into a cell of any type has to get from the capillary into the interstitial space. And then everything that is secreted by a tissue has to get out of that interstitial. And people just treat it as this big black box. You know, we just ignore it. But what we learned in, in the lab I was working in, I'll give you a quick example of how fundamental this is, how crazy important it is, is that even, you know, if you, if you look at a medical textbook, what they will teach you is that things that are small molecules, the size of a salt, something like sodium and chloride, very small molecules, are, they would say, freely diffuse between the bloodstream and the interstitium. And that the barrier is the plasma membrane of cells, the, the cell wall or so. And even water does not freely move through the capillary wall. So we were doing things like, for example, we had to do it in cats, which you can no longer use in medical research. You can't go to a pound and get a cat that's going to be euthanized that afternoon, we would go to them and get them. And, and, and we were able to use cats because they had a big enough muscle mass to do these studies. And you had to literally close off every single blood vessel coming into or out of the leg, much different than the rat high perfusion technique. And so we had pure muscle. And then you could put muscle on a scale just to balance, weigh it, you know, very accurate, very simple technique. And then we could perfuse anything we wanted to through that limb. And we would oftentimes use the animal's own blood, but then we would enrich it with salts or change the osmolality, something like this. So the point to this is that we had control over what we were doing. And what was amazing was that even salt, sodium chloride, something as small as that, we would see is is restricted from diffusing through the capillary wall and into the interstitium. And the, the absolute proof of that, I mean, it's, it's very definitive, is that if you have a change in the salt concentration, you could do this with glucose, by the way, as well, any, any molecules you want, you would see that there's an osmotic transient across that capillary wall, meaning that water comes out of the interstitium and into the bloodstream immediately. And we know that because we were weighing the tissue and the tissue weight would rise when you lower the osmolality in the blood or vice versa. So you'd pull water out of the tissue when you added salt. 
And the point to that is there's no way water could move unless there was a semi-permeable membrane, which had to be the capillary wall. And so we looked at water movement and, and literally we could trace any molecule you wanted to. We use all kinds of molecules. But the point to that is that nothing is freely permeable, not even water across the capillary. And so oftentimes when we talk about hormonal changes, we're measuring something in the blood. We're not measuring something in the tissue. And we would measure the time constant for that. It was depending on the size of the molecule. Even small molecules like salts would take not seconds, but take, you know, an hour or so to equilibrate. Mm -hmm. So it's very fundamental and it would apply to any drug that you deliver. It would apply to anything. Well, sure. And, and like I say, that the, the folks who were studying this in the 1960s were genius. I mean, it was amazing what they could figure out. And it was, is you know, applying laws of physics and very straightforward mathematical equations and mass balance calculations. And, and it was a great training for me, even though I didn't get to continue on. In doing that work, largely for reasons of funding, like I described before, but that it taught me how to think differently. You know, everybody likes to think they're a critical thinker until you really work with somebody who challenges you in ways that you have to develop. So I really appreciated that. Yes, I understand that we both had the good fortune, or uh, some people would uh, not like it, but I think we both had a very independent experience in doing the mm. PhD, a high degree of independence. Is that correct? That's very correct. Yeah. I'm, and my department, the exercise science department was, was very awesome about allowing that. You know, I worked in the, in the medical school and spent all of my time there. I got to take my, most of my classes there, but I still got to benefit from the collegiality and taking some classes in exercise science and so on. And of course, I wanted to to one day figure out how I could apply what I was learning to the questions that related to exercise. And, and uh, I think that even as a master's student, when I was at UT Austin, I had the same opportunity to, to have that kind of independence. And I, I was very curious about how dehydration affected the body and where the water came from and why did it come from different parts of the body, not other parts. And so I thought that, you know, there, there would be ways of applying an understanding of osmolality and tissue fluid balance and solute movement to that question. And maybe, who knows, maybe someday I'll, I'll have one of those uh, halftime retirement type jobs where you get to pursue those things that young people don't get to do. Yep. I have some colleagues exactly in that situation and they're having a great time. You returned to the University of Texas in Houston for your postdoctoral research, this time at the School of Medicine, focusing on physiology, cell biology, and pharmacology. What was that time like? Well, that was a good time, too. This was, now we're in the 1990s, and in the early 1990s was sort of the, the early years of, of when molecular biology was starting to be applied to, to questions like control of metabolism and lipoproteins and and even exercise. And there weren't many people in the exercise field who, who had developed a laboratory that was funded to, to use molecular biology. And Frank Booth was in Houston. And so he, he offered me a position. He had a grant that had been active for about a year or more, but he, he didn't have a current postdoc working on the, that particular project. And so he, it was a great setup where he said, you know, come for a year. I know that, that I'm probably not studying. I was, he was studying, uh, how muscles atrophy with aging and the role of insulin-like growth factors and so on. And he knew that that really wasn't what I had a specific topic, but he said, you'll learn an awful lot about this emerging field that could suit you well in, in the future. And, and I thought that was very generous of him. And turned out I ended up staying there much longer. I, I ended up getting funding uh, of my own, which allowed me to get a, a lab. And so I ended up staying there six years. And so it was a, like I said, an exciting time. But back then it was, and I don't know if you follow this area of work, but everybody was under the suspicion or assumption that you could identify a, a regulatory region of, of a gene and say this region was responsible for either turning on or turning off that, that gene transcription or sometimes post-transcriptional regulation to specific processes. And it was maybe a little bit simplistic uh, turned out that there were a lot of regulatory regions of genes and there's a lot of interactions, but it was um, nonetheless a very productive approach because it had helped a lot of us start to see these things much more clearly. That work that I started then is, is still continuing to this day. So it's been a good long pathway, so to speak. Sounds like it. 
you've uh, made the point in the past that in an age where scientific information is more available to more people than ever before, misperceptions are equally abundant, perhaps more abundant than ever. And you've said this is largely because of remarkably little discussion, not just discussion by the public, but even among scientists about some of the fundamental facts and principles that should be highlighted and should be guiding the way. So, considering all of that, what are a couple fundamental basics of muscle metabolism you'd like our listeners to keep in mind as we continue our conversation? Well, I think starting with the idea that you you oftentimes will hear people say things like, because skeletal muscle is such a large tissue, oftentimes the textbooks will say it's, you know, 45% of body weight, something like that, depending on on how much fat you have. And, and they'll say, owing to the, to the large mass of muscle, it is important for, and then they fill in the blank. If you were studying fluid balance, like I did as a doctoral student, you'd, you'd say that. you say muscle is a big reservoir of water and you can drain it instead of having to dehydrate your brain or your liver or something. And, and people who study metabolism will very explicitly always argue that muscle is important to study because it's a big tissue. And so they would argue that it's, it's almost like a sink in that if you could somehow increase enough muscles contractile activity that then it can it can soak up a lot of blood glucose or blood lipids and do other good things for you and so they sort of just look at it and it's obvious it's a big tissue and everything i just said is true i don't think anybody could deny anything i just said but but what they're missing out is also totally irrefutable, which is that at rest, skeletal muscle has a very low metabolic rate. And it doesn't matter what animal species you're looking at. This is one of the most conserved features about animal physiology is skeletal muscle has a low metabolic rate when it's not working. When I teach students, I say that that makes sense. You know, the body's smart and isn't going to necessarily keep the, the engine of muscle running when you park it in the garage. You want your engine off. And, and so muscle is it's a contractile machine. And when it's not working, it, it doesn't use much energy. And that's a, that seems very simple to say is it, you know, people say it's efficient at rest or whatever, but the implications are, are quite big. And it means that there's a whole lot of misperceptions and we could go through a list of them. I'll just give you just a couple really quick ones that you probably heard before. Things like, like we all appreciate it's important to have a, you don't want to have muscle wasting as we get older or you other reasons that you might lose muscle. And so people say, well, we need to bulk up because we need to improve our metabolism. Well, that's true, but until you get, start to put the numbers to it and, and get quantitative about it. And what you, you start to realize is that muscle at rest is, and these are from, you know, the best methods you can get where you're literally going and putting catheters into the arteries and veins of legs. So you can measure how much oxygen consumption there is in the, in the limb. That, that muscle at rest doesn't account for as much of an energy expenditure and, and utilization of different fuels per pound as, a, as even the average body tissue. And so when you put the numbers to that, for example, after eating a, a meal with carbohydrate in it, people oftentimes will say, well, muscle is the primary insulin dependent tissue for extracting blood glucose. And so they would say that it extracts about 80% of the glucose during hyperinsulinemic conditions. The problem is that those numbers are neglecting a very fundamental fact, which is that, is that that resting muscle is, is unable to utilize whatever it extracts for a fuel at rest because the metabolic rate is so low. And so when, when those studies do those arterial venous catheterization type techniques that are very direct, they'll say that, that they can estimate that muscle only counts for about 15% of the total body carbohydrate oxidation in the postprandial period, meaning that muscle is not burning much glucose. So that's a fundamental problem. It means that muscle needs to be working to take advantage of the mitochondria that are in muscle. And yet you'll see a lot of labs tripping over themselves to, to quantify mitochondria changes and trying to relate it to metabolism. But if those mitochondria are, are silent, you, then you can't take advantage of them. And again, that's sort of a long-winded way of just saying that we have to sometimes look at the numbers and then just use a little logic to, to piece together a whole host of, of implications of things. Well, that sounds like good advice. Yeah, just as a brief aside, Mark, I have to say, opportunity to train with Frank Booth must have been pretty remarkable. I mean, one of the godfathers of the field and, you know, trained himself by 
sort of one of the godfathers, John Halosi, and just must have been a fabulous time. Frank just turned 80, as you well know, and I don't think he'll ever stop. He's still developing seminal discoveries and, and just a fabulous person. Let's go to talk a little bit about your 2004 paper, Exercise Physiology versus Inactivity Physiology. The paper focused on the enzyme lipoprotein lipase and how periods of physical inactivity impact its regulation. What drew your interest here and what did you find? Yeah, well, that was actually a a short, invited review article. It was in a journal that has a desire to publish concise arguments. And so what they said was, you've been giving talks about your research studies for the last several years. And and in those talks, oftentimes you'll conclude with sort of the big picture of where might this be changing a, a concept that's broader than just the molecular regulation of this single gene or enzyme. And what we were seeing was that I described before that I received funding from the NIH through an R01 as a postdoc to study what is regulating the expression of, of this very important enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. And a simple way of thinking about it is that it is sort of the vacuum cleaner for the atherogenic fat that's in your blood. It's the only enzyme that will clear plasma triglyceride or fat from the blood into muscle and adipose tissue. It works by itself. And so it's, it's obviously the rate limiting enzyme as well for this process. And it's very simple in that it lives inside the capillary of, of tissues but it's not made there. It's made in the underlying parenchymal cells, meaning a muscle fiber or adipocyte. And then it has to be secreted and sort of swim upstream through the interstitium and somehow bind to the inside of the capillary, what we call the lumen, where the blood is flowing. And I had uh, naively hypothesized that if you exercise muscle hard through, for example, run training, that maybe you would turn on the the transcription or some other process that caused the muscle to make more of this enzyme. And that would help explain why exercise training is, is healthy for cardiovascular processes and helps distribute fat in a more optimal way. But the 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 truth of it was that I uh, I completely failed at being able to demonstrate that exercise was was a potent way of increasing the amount of lipoprotein lipase activity. And I, I failed in a, in a maybe you call it a robust way, meaning that when, you know, you're, if, you, if you fail once, you just keep trying. And we, we tried all kinds of, of ways of training rats on treadmills where I would run them intensely uh, for different durations and different intensities. And the conclusion was that you could, you could sort of nudge it, but you, you couldn't have an impressive increase in this important enzyme. One thing that we did know, though, and it was just an observation that wasn't part of the actual grant that I was working on, but we did know that there was a big fiber type difference, meaning that some muscles that are more red, the slow oxidative muscles, had much more lipoprotein lipase. I mean, a thousand percent more than other muscles. And it's one of those kind of things you ignore sometimes because you would say, well, yeah, but that's a highly, like the like soleus muscle was the muscle that was so enriched with it. So yeah, but that's a highly specialized muscle. It's not representative of the rest of the body. And so I and others would tend to downplay that kind of finding and we'd measure it, we'd report it, but we didn't think a lot about it. Again, it goes back to that large muscle mass perspective that you want a muscle that's representative of the whole body. And in human research, People would say that, that you know, you biopsy a, a big hefty muscle like the vastus lateralis, which is the biggest thigh muscle. And they say, because it's representative of the rest of the muscles in the body. So again, you're kind of looking for this average effect or whatever, but you're missing out sometimes on what's special. And so it turned out that what I learned was that, and it was largely by accident, to be honest, it, I had a technician and I had her measure lipoprotein lipase activity. After I induced a couple different methods of making the muscle less active than normal, but just for a short amount of time, I didn't expect there to be a change. It was just a few hours of time. And again, it was, it was purely for uh, another reason. And she came back with the results and said, it's not there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's almost immeasurable. And I said, no, 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 this muscle has very high levels. You, your controls are bad. Something's wrong. You know, it's one of those typical examples where the results are, are bigger than you expect. And long story short, we ended up confirming that in a whole string of papers. And then we extend, we said that if, if something is changing this much to where just a short period of hours of inactivity of muscle 
can have this big of a local effect, then what else might be changing? And, and it led us to do studies with microarrays where we could take a less focused approach, a more unbiased approach, you might say, and looking across the, the uh, genome. And we saw lots happening there. And we extended that in a variety of other ways since. But the, the point is, is that we saw fantastically large effects on this enzyme when we made the muscle inactive for a short amount of time, but we couldn't raise it. We can never increase the amount of LPL in that muscle. And remember, this this review was published in 2004, but it means that the work was done years earlier. And, and what it was pointing us towards was that the uh, what some people call the background activity, which is your muscle contractions throughout the whole day, turns out to not be incidental. It turns out not to be just background, uh, which exercise training will improve something on top of it, turned out to be where all the action was, where all the, the really cool, potent cellular regulatory processes are taking place for this process. And so, you know, we ended up writing a very short article on that to explain our work. And we just, you know, had to conclude in there that sometimes bodily processes are very sensitive to, to periods of muscular inactivity throughout the day. And importantly, those processes are distinct. They're qualitatively different than the processes by which an hour of exercise training, or whether it's weight training or uh, aerobic endurance training, might enhance health. In other words, the, the exercise that's recommended in the evidence-based guidelines is sometimes missing the most powerful things that are happening inside your body. And when I teach students, I sometimes will say things like, like, you know, the, the body doesn't know whether you're you're obeying a guideline or not, uh, a recommendation by blue ribbon panel of experts. All it knows is what it sees in its in its environment. And it, it, it knows muscle knows whether it's contracting or not, for example. And, and it will sense that and it will respond in certain according ways. And so that work was never intended to impact how epidemiologists do their work, but it did. It eventually did. And it didn't intend to, to change how the public thinks about what does it mean to be sedentary, but it's, it seems to be doing that too. You published a whole string of papers in 2004, the one we're discussing, but in 2007 and 2008, kind of elaborating on this theme with too little exercise and too much sitting as the name of one of the papers. And that paper had a powerful conclusion very compelling. It, it, the conclusion was it is time to consider excessive sitting a serious health hazard. And as I mentioned, that was in 2008. It's not clear that as a culture, we've re really made much progress on this. And I wondered uh, what you think about that. And if you could just uh, elaborate on that and also consider, you know, when you, when you go to a, a workplace now, including where I am right now at IHMC, it's full of standing desks and all kinds of things, you know, balance platforms and BOSU balls. And I want to get your opinion on the efficacy of these things. Okay. Well, I have to be careful. I don't want to discourage people from, from having a, an enthusiastic approach to paying attention to what they do throughout the day. But I'll give you a very short answer first and maybe it'll involve a follow-up discussion. But that I would say that th those types of approaches were an unintended consequence of what we were saying, at least what I was thinking. Maybe I didn't say it well. But that what we were trying to say was that a lot of times in, in, in science, not a lot of times, sometimes in science, we identify a problem. And that's Big enough. That's good enough for that day, right? We just need to identify it. Now, what we do about it, we'll take additional research. But oftentimes people get creative or, or, or get a little smart for themselves in that they say, aha. So if sitting with a, with a low metabolic rate in muscle is bad, then standing must be good. You know, and we're like, no, we didn't say that. And I could see where people kind of think that, but that, that hadn't been studied and we didn't know what was going on there. And there's a lot of issues wrapped up in it. But we would try to say things like, like, well, if, you know, those of us who grew up in the sixties and seventies, where you, you couldn't go out in public without coming home without smelling like smoke from tobacco, right? Cigarettes and our clothes were reeking with a smell. We didn't think the secondhand smoke was bad. We didn't pay much attention to chewing tobacco. And most of us who grew up in a smoking culture didn't think that it was even rebellious to partake. And so 
And we did all those kinds of things, but it wasn't because of necessarily a lack of evidence. There was some evidence then, but that it was more one of these attitudes of, well, everybody does it. And if everybody does it, and, you know, then surely it can't be that bad for us, you know, and that kind of thing. And that was sort of the attitude that, that we, not just by the public we saw, but, but even, even by, for example, NH panels that you think would be a little bit more open minded and forward thinking to learning new things. They say things like, we, we're going to fund your study. We really like the basic science of what you're doing, but the significant section of this grant really bothers me because you said it might have some implication to sitting in people. And I said, but, but sitting is, is when predominantly people are awake, we're inactive, we're sitting. It's just nothing special about sitting. It, you could be, you know, just a resting muscle. But they didn't like that idea because it was, I don't know, somehow what seemed too broad of a problem. But I think that it's, it's one of those kind of things that's incontrovertible. You'd say every man, woman, and child on earth I can guarantee you this is probably the case. We can't generalize things like this all the time. So you can make these very bold, definitive statements. And every animal that we have ever studied, when muscle's not working, it has a very low metabolic rate. And that means that processes like that lipoprotein lipase, that's its job is for bringing fuel into the muscle. There's not a need for upregulating those processes. And so there's a lot of implications to that. There's cardiovascular responses too. I mean, blood flow is a very important process to prevent blood clots, to improve shear stress and the health of blood vessels and other processes. And so we said the implications are kind of big here, folks, <laughs> that, that humans are spending most of their time. We actually spend more time per day sitting inactive than we sleep. So if we said, what's the most ubiquitous human behavior if he's sitting inactive? The average person is now sitting about 10 hours a day inactive. So that's 70 hours a week. And I dare say that very few people get to exercise that much. And yet muscle will sense and respond to whether it's contracting or not. It, it doesn't matter who you are, what you are. The metabolic rate will rise in the muscles that are working. And there will be other processes that, that come along with that. All right. So you just mentioned, Mark, that it doesn't matter who you are, male, female, old, young, the impact of sitting is profound and it's going to affect everyone. But over the course of all these studies, did you see any sex differences worth noting in the research? And in other words, is there an impact of inactivity for women versus men that, that is worth talking about? Well, th that's a, that's, yeah, that's a tough one. The, the answer is yeah, no. For the really fundamental things that I think are most important, the answer is no. And our early work was done in, in rats and we actually looked at that specifically. Most of our studies were done in female rats, uh, female mice. They're a little bit easier to, to manage and they don't grow big and fat like the males did. And we were oftentimes asked by reviewers, could you go and do another study now in, in male rats? And we'd done it in male rats to start with. They would have never asked probably. But the, so we did that. We couldn't see any differences in that. And so I think that muscle is less responsive perhaps than say adipose tissue or some other processes. But when you, when you start to look at the, the more what I call the descriptive applied clinical literature, that's when you get into these things that are sort of a, well, it depends kind of answer. So for example, I have seen some studies where they, they've looked at prolonged sitting. And again, when we say sitting, I want to remind your audience, we don't mean sitting per se is the problem. It's muscular inactivity. There is no evidence of a molecular sensor in your buttocks that somehow knows you're sitting and then starts doing bad things to you. It's much more straightforward than that. The, the muscles aren't working and that's what we're talking about. But in the more descriptive clinical literature, when they do this prolonged sitting studies and what they'll do is maybe feed them up carbohydrate rich meal and see what happens to, to glucose and insulin responses. There are some studies that suggest that there might be gender differences and, and that's, there are also differences between ethnicities and those kind of things, but that I'm not an expert on that. Uh, and in the, in the study we're going to talk about in a second, we, we were cognizant of those things. And so we, you know, even though it wasn't designed for this purpose, we did break down the results to look at men versus women. And we saw absolutely no difference with regards to the role of soleus muscle contractile activity, even though, like I say, that some of these studies are looking at, uh, at other types of treatments are, are seeing some differences. So before we get into some of that more current research, just following what Ken had asked about earlier, standing desks and so forth, I'm curious, you know, what's your opinion of the current sort of smartwatch 
algorithms for promoting intermittent standing and benchmarks that are built into the watch for movement time and so forth. I find these algorithms a little frustrating because the watch knows how old you are. It knows if you're male or female, and it sort of defines for you what your targets should be when it doesn't know you. Right. Well, and, and it, it, yeah, I mean, you, you are right. And you've got, the, you've got the problem of what do you do about it, right? And, and I hate to say this, but because it's, again, we don't want to dampen the enthusiasm of, of people for trying to do something personally to enhance their health. We don't have enough people trying, frankly. But that, you know, all the big companies want some sort of legacy for healthcare. I mean, it's, it's really interesting that Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple, said that Apple should be known as a healthcare company eventually. That's going to be their legacy. And Elon Musk is doing the same type of thing. Jeff Bezos with Amazon. And those are just examples of three of the biggest companies in the world that have nothing to do with healthcare in the past, but they're in a race to create something. And so the individuals are, are, are also you sort of have this dichotomy where you have a lot of people who might have a, some serious health problems and will do nothing about it. And then you have others who are by all standards doing okay, but they they are eager to look at something. And I'm not critical of either either approach because to be honest, people need to be, if they have a serious health problem, need to be informed more than just with an educational blanket statement, but to make it actionable, it, it might be helpful to for them to to quantify things. The problem is, what do you quantify and what are you going to do about it? And that's where I would argue that these companies that are spending millions of dollars are, as far as I could tell, going in all the wrong places. Because, and, and I'll be very blunt about it, it's, it's not insulting to say this, that they would do a lot better as well as the individuals who are looking for ways of promoting their own health is to learn how to think more physiologically, think about how the body works, it doesn't mean that you're looking necessarily for the latest protocol, you know, do this, this, and this, and then you'll get this clinically benefit, beneficial result. Oftentimes that can lead you down the wrong bunny trail. And it, when you start to think physiologically, now you can actually apply a little bit more logic to what you're doing that are based on some very sound principles. And we'll talk about some of those maybe a little bit later today, but that it's, these are things that, that at least would not be debated scientifically. They're things that, that are almost factual and, are, and can be highly quantitative. And then when you can piece those together, you can start to figure out what should these watches be measuring or what should people be doing that are actionable and not just waiting for you know the, the latest fitness tip of the month. Yeah, I think actionable is a key term there. And mm -hmm. I know that's the ultimate goal, but it's just a, it's a curious time that we're in with all of this sort of information overload and what to do with it. Let's talk about your 2014 paper, Sedentary Behavior as a Mediator of Type 2 Diabetes. In this work, you talked about utilizing moderate to vigorous physical activity as typically recommended to combat type 2 diabetes, but this did not fully counter the negative physiological toll of too much sitting. And I think this sort of led you back to your roots in muscle metabolism and fiber type differences. And the acute responses metabolically of relatively fatigue resistant slow twitch or type 1 myofibers or slow twitch muscles critical to combating the negative impacts of too much sitting. So, in thinking about this, why is the metabolism in a slow twitch oxidative muscle so key here for understanding the healthy response to uh, load or moderate activity? Yeah. So, this is where it gets really interesting and exciting because. I spoke before about the, the idea that take a, a common laboratory model like a, like a lab rat. We know all about its fiber type. People have gone in and they've looked at every muscle in it. And we knew from that that the soleus muscle was almost completely what we call slow oxidative muscle. And despite the fact that in the rat, 95% of the rest of the muscle mass is different than that. It's this fast glycolytic type muscle. And so there's this huge dichotomy going on there. And when we look at other animals, we hear what's amazing about this. This is one of these overlooked things that once you appreciate it, it starts to change your perspective, is that in every animal that's ever, the solace has ever been studied, it's, it's unique and it's special. That says a lot. I mean, think about this, is that you take an animal like a cat. You know, cats are, are known for being sedentary. Cats are known for being good sprinters. They lay around and then they wait for their whatever little prey they're going to jump on to get their next meal. And then they lay around some more. 
And so they're very good at sprinting. It doesn't matter what kind of cat you talk about, but the cat's soleus muscle is 100% slow twitch oxidative muscle, 100%. And so we knew this not just from the, you know, back in the 1960s when they first started doing muscle physiology on different fiber types with Ernest. They were looking at fatigue properties and they saw that the soleus can be very fatigue resistant compared to other muscles. They did this in cats, you know, and, and then they would compare it to another muscle. And they looked at metabolism, looked at all kinds of things. But what's even more impressive than that to me is that the very first, really what I would call laboratory-based muscle physiology study ever done, there's actually a series of them, was done by a, a French scientist named Ron Vier. Those of you who are medical students have probably heard of Ron Vier because of the neurobiology work that he did. He was a neuroanatomist eventually. And so they call it the nodes of Ron Vier, if you know that phrase. So Ron Vier was a genius because this was the Civil War era. This is the 1860s and 1870s. And Ron Vier figured out how to develop equipment where he could go in and he would look at muscles of different species. And he would look at that. He called the domesticated cat was one that he included. He also included domesticated rabbits versus wild rabbits. And, you know, he's from Europe. So he had this European hare that was like a sort of a Texas jackrabbit, a very active, more of a slow twitch kind of animal. And he compared them and he did this with these different animals, but he didn't just go and look at the muscle. He actually did physiology studies where he would stimulate the muscle electrically, measure the contractile properties, if you can believe this. And that he would say that this the soleus, for some reason, in all these animals is slow and contracting. And, he, you know, he said he had to write in French. And so I have trouble translating exactly. But he, he used fun expressions. He looked at the capillarization, which we talked about before. Remember, those are the smallest blood vessels in the body where all oxygen and water and solutes have to be exchanged between the tissue and the blood. And he says that the capillaries in the soleus are exquisitely curvy, was his quote. He could see this stuff. I mean, this was, again, before we had cars. And he looked at fatigue properties. And he says that they were fatigue resistant. And he scratched his head and he said things like, why? Well, you know, what's going on here? And again, I, I give that as a interesting story because it, it, it helps a lot of us say, well, if in the 1960s, these guys were, were doing these great studies on this. And then Ron Vier was doing it a hundred years earlier. We knew that, that this muscle was unique. And what we were seeing when we were looking at the effects of local contractile activity or inactivity, periods of, you know, hours of inactivity, sometimes chronic inactivity, we were seeing that the soleus was falling to pot when it wasn't working quickly. And we were seeing that it was very responsive to acute contractions throughout the day. And, but we were also seeing that, that traditional kinds of exercise training, well, sometimes would nudge it, sometimes wouldn't change it at all. It depends on where it started. And so we thought that you have to pay attention to this, that the animal researchers to this day still always would, would never think of publishing a paper without having two or three different kinds of muscles to compare the results. Unfortunately, human research is almost never done that way. I would, you, you would know the numbers better than I, Marcus, but. I would probably say it has to be well over 90, 95% of all human studies. It doesn't matter whether it's pharmaceutical study or whether it's exercise study, nutrition study. It's usually based on a single muscle called the vastus lateralis. And the assumption is, well, human muscles are mosaic of fiber types and blah, blah, blah. That's true. But again, they're missing out that there might be a very unique muscle in the body even in cats, even in highly sedentary people who, who do do very little. And this muscle might have remarkable properties that can enhance the health of the whole person. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, health span, resilience, and performance. So that is a perfect way to segue to your 2022 article, which appeared in the journal iScience. And it's in this article that you introduce the notion of a soleus push-up. The article is titled, 
a potent physiological method to magnify and sustain soleus oxidative metabolism, improves glucose and lipid regulation. This is a very interesting article, and we've received maybe a dozen questions about the article here at STEM Talk. Before we get to the soleus push-up, however, let's discuss the soleus muscle itself. You've kind of already done that, so we don't need a deep dive, but it comprises something like 1% of a human's body weight, and your work has demonstrated that it can sustain sufficient metabolic rate for a long duration and thereby improve glucose and lipid metabolism if properly activated. So can you tell us what proper activation of the soleus muscle would look like? Yeah, it's it's actually good that you picked up on that. Uh, Other people who have asked me about this usually skip over that. So when we say proper activation, what we, what I really mean by that is that the soleus is used for any kind of of standing weight bearing activity you do. It's, it's essential for that. So anytime you, you stand and you walk, It's the muscle that's most important for your balance and propelling you forward when your ankle is bending. And so it's it's working harder than other muscles to do that. But the body is smart in that it's it's developed features. Sometimes there are anatomical reasons for it. And in other cases, it's more cellular so that the soleus, even though it's working hard and producing some power there for you, it's very strong muscle. It can do it in a, what we call a, a energy conserving way. And so this is really important to understand we, to understand the soleus push-up development. There's a lot that we couldn't stuff into the first paper on this. And so we have more, more work we did in animals and humans. And the bottom line is that the soleus, when we're standing and walking, is working almost entirely in what we'd call an isometric mode, which means the same length. So in other words, if you look at your calf muscle when you're walking and you put your foot down on the ground and then you start to move forward, you'll notice your ankle's bending and you'll say, aha, the soleus is bending. But what you're really doing at that point is you're stretching this massive Achilles tendon. And that tendon is is massive for a reason. All of your body weight is on that one leg when you're walking and it's stretching that tendon. And the body's really cool in how it will... As it does this, it, it will take the slack out, so to speak, and allow the soleus to work almost without changing its length. And you say, well, why is that important? It's important because we and others have, have shown that when the soleus in humans or in animals is contracting isometrically, it uses only about a third of the energy that it uses when it's shortening contractions. And so, so oftentimes it's one of the classic phenotypic characteristics of the soleus, people say it's very efficient. It needs less ATP. And a large part of that is is it's measured under conditions when the muscle is isometric. And when you take a muscle out of an animal or a person and attach it to a little clamp on each end and you stimulate to work, if the muscle's not shortening during that, which usually it's not, it is very efficient. And that comes down to these little molecular motors that are part of a protein called myosin which is one of the most abundant proteins in the body, and that myosin works in the soleus and in other slow twitch muscle very efficiently when it's isometric. Well, that's great, but what we said was humans, our problem isn't how little calories we burn and how little fuel we use. Our problem is that we don't do it enough. And so so we were interested in a method that would capitalize upon the good things about the soleus, perhaps, but, but actually make it use more energy than when standing and walking. And so we developed a straightforward approach, it seemed, but it took years to actually do. And we were able to make the soleus active, meaning that the motor neurons that are electrically stimulating it are only when the muscle is shortening and under a relatively good range of motion. And that led to much more energy expenditure per gram or per kilogram of muscle than we would have otherwise seen. And so it's an isolated contractile activity designed to utilize energy by the soleus. But also it's important to say that you're doing it while sitting, which means that the the only resistance that's offered to the contraction is the weight of the leg itself. And when you're sitting, if you put your feet on a scale, the weight of your legs is about 25% of your body weight. So it's not 100% of your body weight, like if you were standing or walking. And that's actually turned out to be important for, for other reasons. And we haven't yet published this data, but it's really cool. And that when the soleus muscle is shortening against a relatively light load, it means that for the same level of effort, you get a higher velocity of contraction. So remember, you think about 
the power of a muscle is the force times the velocity. If you have less force, then the muscle can, can contract at a higher velocity. And again, this is the reason we call it a slow twitch muscle is because people say, well, it's sort of designed to contract under slow contractile states. But when you make it contract under a relatively fast contractile state while shortening, which is the opposite of walking, the muscle is actually more energy demanding, but it also, we didn't predict this, it changes some of the other physiological properties that are taking place in terms of the fatigue properties, for example. The muscle is less fatiguing for a given level of activation when it's got a light load, but a high velocity compared to if you have a little bit heavier load and slower velocity. So there's something about fatigue that has to do with tension on the muscle that I don't quite understand. But it's a beautiful case where, where the muscle can work during the soleus push-up at an oxygen consumption that are another way of thinking of this, a metabolic rate that's much higher than when you're walking or even running. And we'll, we can, we'll probably talk about that in a second, but that's some of the data we collected for this paper. Yeah, so let's talk about the structure of the study itself. Tell us a little bit about the characteristics of the participants. And then also, I'm curious, pretty long-term protocol for the cellulose so push-up protocol, you know, 270 minutes, that's a long time. Can you talk about the protocol itself and how many contractions were performed during the, the, the protocol? Sure. So we actually had, in this particular paper, two sub-studies, different participants and, and different purposes. But the 270 minutes, is, is, it's interesting how uh, the media works, is that I've gotten more questions about that. I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. <laughs> but that, let me answer this, is that what we were trying to do is we wanted prolonged contractual activity. Remember, we were interested in testing whether or not ordinary people is defined by this is answering your other question too. Ordinary people is defined by being relatively inactive except for ordinary activities of daily living. And, and so you can put them on a treadmill and you could uh, measure VO2 max, for example, to their maximum cardioaerobic capacity. And, and the subjects that we tested were, what do you say, on the low end of, of normal, although normal is pretty low. And, and so, so these people work what you call fit but like these cats of Ron VA or the, the, the domesticated rabbits of Ron VA back in the 1800s, they do have a soleus muscle that still has phenotypic properties that make it special compared to the rest of the body. And so, so we said, well, we want to study, you know, what's going on inside this muscle. And so if we were able to take these, you know, ordinary people and then challenge them to say, well, what can the soleus do? How, how soon will it fatigue? We picked 270 minutes as four and a half hours because that's a long period of time. That most people don't exercise even in, in a whole week. And we said, well, we'll make them do it in one, you know, one shot, one day. And we didn't actually, you know, we had a beautiful opportunity here because the people didn't know what the heck we were doing this for. It was an unusual exercise. They're sitting there talking to you and we've got all this equipment on them measuring different things. And that we didn't tell them that our hypothesis was that this would be a fatigue resistant behavior. Remember, this was the first study we did, in fact. And so we had to collect the data first to know that. But that as they sat there, they never exhibited any sign of increasing effort. If I asked even a very fit person like the two of you to walk on a treadmill for four and a half hours, I'm sure you could do it. You guys are pretty fit. But I think you'd progressively start to feel a little bit more tired in certain muscle groups as you did it, especially if the, the local VO2 in the muscle that was working is above that when you're exhausted, doing exhaustive running on a treadmill. And so what we did is we put these people at an intensity where the muscle VO2 was well above, I mean, eight, eight times higher than, than walking and two times higher than in the last minute of a VO2 max test. A VO2 max test is an incremental test, a stress test, where you, you make the person run at a higher speed or, or grade on the treadmill each, each 30 seconds, each minute. And then eventually they poop out. And that last 30 seconds or minute is the most oxygen consumption that your muscles can help utilize. And there's a great stress on the muscle at that point. And so we had people working at a local VO2, not a whole body VO2, just local down there at the soleus, higher than if that last minute of a VO2 max test that would last a minute. Hmm. And, and so these ordinary people 
were able to do that for 270 minutes, eventually you got to stop the study. Now, you know, we, we, of course, since then for, for all kinds of cool reasons have said, what are the limits of human endurance? Can you do this, for example, seven days a week? Can, can you do it for months on time? You know, it, it's, a, it's a lot of very fun things for a person who's interested in performance and endurance and muscle physiology to do. And we've done some of those th- type of things. So just real quick to wrap that up, for someone envisioning what this looks like four and a half hours, about how many contractions per minute? So the short answer is, is it doesn't matter that much how many contractions per minute. It's more the range of motion that you're doing it at. And it comes down to what we we're talking about before. But the, I'll, I'll give you a sort of a range is that when we're walking, you, you know, you might be stepping at, at a step rate of hundred steps a minute. And that means it's 50 per leg. That's a good starting point for solace pushups. It's something that's, that, you, you know, most people can, can voluntarily sit there and activate the muscle at a good high EMG. In other words, uh, electromyography it means it's sort of the intensity of how hard the motor neurons are electrically exciting. And that'd be a starting point. And we've actually learned that you can go too fast and, and you get up to a rate over, or say 130, which is still, I mean, you can move much faster. I mean, if people can sit there and fidget their leg, sort of this, what I call fluttering at maybe 350 times a minute. You see people doing this sometimes sort of as a, just an involuntary habit. But that's actually an efficient motion, surprisingly. It's, we have another conversation about it, but that's too fast. So, so between 50 and 100, maybe 130 contractions per minute uh, throughout that time is a, is a good rate. So could you briefly uh, summarize the primary findings of the study? You've touched on them a little, but in a concise way, could you tell us what the primary findings were? Because they were kind of remarkable. Okay. So remember, there are two subsides. So the first one was that people could elevate the local muscle VO2, the muscle that's recruited at a very high energy demand, very high oxygen consumption, which means that the cardiovascular system was not limiting the amount of oxygen consumption, but it also means that local processes were quite special. And when it was doing that, uh, they could sustain it for hours, not minutes. So that's from the first step of the study. Now, at the same, in those same people, we also took muscle biopsies and we were very interested in what's going on inside the muscle. And the salient finding that I reported in that paper was that muscle glycogen, which is normally the predominant fuel for contractile activity, glycogen is a form of carbohydrate that's stored in muscle. And when it's broken down, it forms glucose and then glucose goes through a metabolic pathway called glycolysis. And, and that then the end product of glycolysis can either produce lactic acid, or it can go through the mitochondria for what we call oxidative metabolism, where you can get more energy per unit of glucose when you do that. But glycogen breakdown is by far the normal type of substrate or fuel that muscle would be using. Muscle can use a lot of different substrates, but this is the the bulk of it. So for example, many, many studies that have looked at exercise in humans of all different types of cycling, walking, you name it, has shown that that the soleus included predominantly relies on glycogen when glycogen is at normal levels. If you, if you got it, you'll use it. And so even at intensities as low as 25, 30% of VO2 max, glycogen still accounts for about 70 to 90% of all of the carbohydrate that the muscle will use. And so it's a glycogen-centric world out there, so to speak, when it comes to exercise. What we saw surprisingly to us was that we took biopsies, serial biopsies, meaning that we took them at different time points. We took one intermediate, about 130 minutes of contractions, another 270. And we saw that glycogen depletion rates were very slow compared to the energy demand. And so it meant that, that the muscle had to be using something other than glycogen as a fuel. So in that first paper, the glycogen finding was, was quite important for propelling us to do the second sub-study because we realized that t- there's two things about this. One is if you're not using glycogen, you have to use something else. And one of the something else can be fat metabolism. And that's contingent upon what you've last eaten or what you haven't eaten. And we showed in that first study also that the type of fat that's in the blood that is extremely a hot topic in the last few years for heart disease is called VLDL. It's very low density lipoprotein. And we saw that when doing the Solis push-ups, that this VLDL type of fat was decreased significantly. And 
it was decreased in a way that exercise has trouble doing the same thing, meaning that a hard bout of exercise or even exercise training has trouble improving this. And so we were impressed by the reduction in this fat, VLDL, but we, we did that pretty much under conditions where the people weren't challenged with a carbohydrate rich meal. So in other words, they're, they were, we say, sort of in that transition to fasting. And so they had more fat metabolism. The last key finding though, in that first study was that the ability to burn fat for sustained periods of time throughout this contractile activity, pretty impressive. So th- these people were able to more than double the whole body fat oxidation just by the small muscle mass activity, even in the fastest state. And we followed up on that in people who are on low carb diets and prolonged fast and these types of things. And, and as m- many people who are sometimes rightly so interested in what can we do to increase our fat oxidation in the body nutritionally, we, what we've seen is that sitting there and doing the soleus push up is a way to double whatever those numbers are that you can reach. And so people who are, for example, eating low carb diets are trying to increase fat burning and so on. And we show that this single action, the single muscle group is literally doubling those, those, that fat burning. So that was the first study. That was the big one. With respect to those findings, what surprised you the most? Was there something that really was not predicted? You mentioned one, something that you had not hypothesized. Yeah, I certainly didn't expect that glycogen use would be as low as it was given the high energy expenditure of this muscle locally, that almost everything in the muscle physiology, exercise physiology literature would say that that when a muscle is intensely recruited, it will burn down glycogen. And then when it doesn't have glycogen, it's going to switch over to using other fuels. But if you've got it, you'll use it, so to speak. And like I said, it's the predominant carbohydrate that's used, much more so than blood glucose. And a lot of people lose sight of that, but that this isn't new science here, but that blood glucose typically accounts for 10, 15, maybe 20% of the total carbohydrate that's used, but it's that glycogen use. And so, and again, it's a, it's an intensity dependent process, meaning that the harder the muscles working, and it makes sense that the muscle's going to need to have that immediate fuel that's residing inside of the muscle cell. And it, and all it has to do is snip off a uh, one little glucose molecule off of glycogen and there's the glucose. There's no need to transport it through the blood and through the interstitial and across the plasma membrane. It's right there to use. And you almost can't avoid using glycogen. So the fact that with these kind of contractions, it, it, it the muscle preferred to use the bloodborne fuels was an important insight. Like I said, it propelled us to the second study to look closer at this, at the carbohydrate metabolism. So, Mark, as you know, the myofiber type composition or the muscle fiber type of the human soleus is about 80 to 90 percent type 1, as we've talked about, and these are highly oxidative and relatively fatigue resistant. Did you detect, because you did do the biopsies, did you detect any interesting individual differences between participants based on uh, fiber type distribution? Even though we know it's primarily type 1, some people are higher than others. Yeah, no, no, we we didn't. Um, meaning that everybody that we've tested, even way beyond this subgroup of people that are reported on here, we've tested obviously additional people in the follow up studies, and that everybody we've tested seems to have a soleus that is innately capable of doing soleus push ups very well, independent of age. You asked before about sex; it's different. It's not. It's not related to that. Young and old, and we've t- tested in school kids. We've tested. In, and it's, so it's, it's, again, it takes us back to that concept that Ron VA was speaking about. We all ignored for 150 years, which was that there's something innately special about the soleus, regardless of your habitual activity or inactivity and genetics. So when it comes to burning calories, and we've talked a lot about the energy burning boost of this. One of the underpinnings of sort of the current craze toward higher intensity exercise is the metabolic boost during the long-term post-exercise recovery. I think the higher intensity of the exercise, the less economical it is. This translates into greater energetic demands during recovery, and I think a lot of that underlies some of our current crazes with HIIT training and other things. So given this and your current findings, have you considered an alternative to the sitting SPUs that would demand more intensity? And I ask this because the lower the exercise economy is, right, the more you will boost your metabolism overall. We want to be, we want to have low economy and burn a lot of energy for the amount of work we put in. So have you thought about alternatives? 
Well, it, it, it's, it's certainly this is an important point, and maybe this is where you're you're going with this. Is it, first of all, we're we're not talking about an either or proposition. I understand that if somebody said, I have, a, a, you know, several days a week, I can spend up to an hour to get my exercise and I can either go to the weight room and do resistance training, or I can do aerobic training, or I can do this or that. SPUs don't fit into that. It's not something that you, you do instead of, it's not either or that. And the reason is, is that we're looking for an understanding of, of how to sustain oxidative metabolism and other effects of contractile activity for hours per day, throughout the whole day, every day, each and every day. So it's not competing with or interfering with what you do in that hour of recreational activity. And frankly, from a biological standpoint, they're not compatible either. They're doing different things to your body. They're, they're working through different processes. I think this is actually, this is a really, really important point. And this is where sort of the media can go awry. I think it's important for the listener to understand this is not a substitute. This is an entirely different phenomenon, which will overall boost your metabolism over 24 hours. So it's not an alternative, as you said, or a substitute for other types of exercise, but certainly a, a supplement to that. And I, I, unfortunately, as you well know, when compelling findings like yours hit the street, it can get twisted and turned pretty quickly. This often happens as well when somebody you know, discovers a new molecule that is somehow linked to an exercise adaptation, and suddenly we don't need the sweat, we just need the molecule. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, again, it's you have to be logical about this and think like a physiologist is what I would say to students. So, so what do we mean by being logical? What do we mean by thinking physiological? What we mean is instead of looking for a protocol of some sort and say, do A, B, and C, and you'll get some kind of potentially clinically meaningful result. Those types of things are not really what we're going after in at least my own lab. There's a place for that kind of work, but it's what I would call descriptive research. It usually ends up in a long list of caveats where people would end up saying things like, well, it depends. You know, you asked questions about gender a second ago, or we could talk about this or that. And so, so what we're looking for are what are more basic fundamental uh, call them facts for the public here, just principles that would be solid. And and then you would take those solid findings and how can it perhaps shape and inform how we live. So in this case, we would say that it's pretty solid fact that, that humans spend a lot of time sitting at a low metabolic rate. That's solid. We put people in, in these special rooms called metabolic chambers where we can measure the oxygen consumption every minute of the day. And we can ask them to type and to use computers. And, and you get the result that you'd expect, that energy expenditure is low. And then you could put devices on people and say, how much do they sit? And they spend more time doing that than sleeping. So then we say, now logically, you take those two things together. Nobody would probably argue that it's not doing your body a lot of good to be doing that. Uh, it's not helping you. So what can we look for as a solution? And, and again, the soleus push-up, as far as I know, I would say it's the development of the first type of muscular activity specifically geared for improving human metabolism. I mean, think about that for a second. I know it sounds a little audacious, but it really is the, the first type that, that's specifically geared and developed for improving human metabolism. Mm -hmm. Most of what we do in exercise physiology is we take things that people already do. So, for example, we already walk a lot, right? We step a lot. Some people stand, yes, uh, and obviously bicycle and other things. And then we say, that's that we need to do more of it. I wouldn't deny that. But we they would say, now what happens in the body? And then you can you can interrogate with all kinds of measurements. You could take blood samples, you can do molecular biology, you could do epidemiological studies, whatever you want. And you would say, will doing more of that walking or stepping or bicycling or weightlifting be good for us? And why is it good for us? That's an important thing to do. But what we we came about this from a very different angle. And what we were trying to, to say, there's this need to develop a type of muscular activity that's specifically geared for improving human metabolism throughout the whole day. And Marcus, I know I still haven't answered your question about the high intensity training, but, but when you, I kind of am, because is if you realize that the high intensity training is fantastic for some processes, but you could pretty logically assume that whatever those processes that are turned on within seconds of sprinting, for example, 
that those signals are going to look very different than the signals that are turned on by a subtle yet sustained increase in oxidative metabolism by us locally in a soleus muscle for hours per day, not minutes. And so it's a different, it's, it's touching on a different set of biochemical pathways, a different uh, physiological response in the cardiovascular system. And it's, it's hopefully, you know, uh, meeting some of those needs that have been very difficult, including uh, our own lab to come up with solutions for. So, so it's, it's different qualitatively. Like we said in that 2004 article that you, you talked about, you know, it's, th- there's some very potent processes that are qualitatively different than what happens in that hour that you get to exercise. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Uh, we've discussed the soleus push-up in some detail, but we haven't described for the listener how one actually performs a soleus push-up. Could you give us the brief description of how a person does the soleus push-up properly? So the first point is that at the end of the day, what you're hoping to accomplish is a way of, of sustaining an elevated rate of this oxidative muscle metabolism for as much time as, as, as you desire. So that's important because you can do it sitting, obviously. And when you're sitting, you want to sit comfortably so that you can, if you're going to be sitting there to say to work right now, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting talking to you guys and I'm not going to waste my time by sitting here inactive when I could simultaneously be doing something that's remarkably good for me. And so it does alter a little bit how you sit sometimes, you know, you have to maybe think twice about what kind of chair you're in or or how you're reclining. In a research study, we were very careful to, to keep the rest of the body very relaxed. But that when sitting too, the other thing is I I mentioned before that you want the the soleus to be shortening during the contraction. And I mentioned in answering Marcus's question about rate, that the rate wasn't the critical determinant of the energetics, but rather it was the shortening over relatively good range of motion. Meaning that, that if you sat here and you put your foot down on the ground and I said, now, now I want you to lift your heel what kind of range can you achieve? You, you could probably say, well, I can get a better range of motion if I pull my foot back so that my toes are kind of under my knee rather than my feet in front of me. And so you actually would have a higher energy demand when doing solo push-ups if you pulled your foot back. The motion is a is sort of a smooth, fluid motion. It, it's one that's much like uh, if you're listening to music and just having a good time and you're relaxed, you would be able to contract the muscle without thinking about what you're doing, then you're probably doing something right. If you're concentrating too much about it and you're trying to tighten things up, then you've sort of fallen back into this mentality of it needs to hurt to do me some good. That's probably true to a certain degree. If, if I'm doing weightlifting, I'm not going to grab a 10 pound bar and, and push it and say, okay, I did 10 reps. I'm good enough. You know, you, you actually want to stress the muscle to see the adaptations you want. This is different in that if done right, surprisingly, there's not fatigue and there's not this exertion. And unfortunately, what we have are, we literally now have hundreds of people who have produced videos on how to do the soleus push-up, and none of them have any firsthand experience or expertise. And you'll, they frequently will say things like, eh, okay, squeeze the muscle so it gets really tight. And I think what they're trying to say is, this can't be doing me good unless it's hurting me. And the, the, the muscle cells don't care whether or not your your brain is saying this is difficult to do. It doesn't care what's happening in the rest of the body. It just says, I need a fuel. And if I need a fuel, I'm going to get it. And so it's not necessary. So again, it's a fluid motion where you're isolating the soleus. You don't try to lift the leg either. I see some people, they, they sort of use their hips or thighs or something. They're, that's not necessary. Again, you're trying to target it to a, to a small muscle group. And then the last thing I'll say is that if you practice anything, you're going to get better at it. And a lot of people get too hung up on trying to optimize something on day one. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's much, it's much smarter. This is applies to any kind of sport. Just get out there and do it. And, and if you do enough of it, your motor control improves and you become more fluid and smooth and graceful and you learn how to sit. If I were to be coaching people on a walking program, the first thing is just get out there and you do it a bunch. And, and you don't have to advise them what kind of shoes to get and other things. Eventually, they're going to get the right kind of shoes and they'll figure out ways to be creative to do more and more of it. Same thing with Solis Push-Up. The goal is to, to learn how to do this involuntarily 
so that you can you can now be sitting there for you know roughly 10 hours a day and reaping the benefits of elevated muscle metabolism for dozens of hours per week. And then when you go do your normal exercise, you, you go do it. When you want to get up and walk around, you do it. You don't, you don't intentionally sit down and spend more time sitting to do this. It's only when you ordinarily would be sitting, and which is a highly intermittent activity that people do. I'm thinking that this could be useful for people who take a lot of long flights, like a flight to Europe or something like that. You'd have plenty of opportunity to do soleus push-ups. It uh, might amaze and dismay your neighbor uh, in the seat. I once, uh, right after um, 911, made the mistake of hooking up a prototype electrical muscle stimulation device. So I had cables and wires everywhere mm -hmm. on a flight to Rome just, you know, to keep muscles active, maybe not uh, develop DVTs or something. The poor lady next to me really came unglued and pushed the button asking the flight attendant to take a look at uh, my device and see if it was dangerous. And uh, <laughs> the flight attendant was quite envious. She said, you know, they, they ought to give us those things. You know, we fly back and forth to Rome constantly. But um, yeah. the Soleus push-up would be somewhat less uh, dramatic and probably quite sure. useful. Yeah, we, we, once we reached the stage where we realized that ordinary people with ordinary fitness could sustain this for hours, that we realized that, okay, there's going to need to be a way of ensuring that people don't need to go out and buy a contraption of some sort, an exercise machine to carry around with them. The difficulty that, of course, is people like those little machines. Absolutely. And you asked before, Marcus asked about wearables. There's definitely a place for the wearables in this type of thing because you want to quantify what you're doing and it's you gamify it, but also to teach people what's the right motion. I don't mean to scare people off. Anybody can learn this physically. It's not complicated. But I also, I'd say that there is a need for at least trying to learn from somebody who has direct knowledge from, you know, research type setting of how to teach people to do this. And it's any good coaching is usually based on experience. And we've had a lot of experience in, in how to articulate the right, the wrong ways of doing it and not to overcomplicate certain aspects. And just to, like I said before, if you get better, then you can get another lesson. You get a little bit better. You know, if I just invented the bicycle and nobody had ever ridden a bicycle and I was telling people, hey, I've got this machine where you could ride 20 miles an hour and you can go all over the place. People say, this is fantastic. And they would go out and buy a bicycle and they would, within about 30 seconds, ride it into the ditch and then start cussing and say, well, this isn't working. What's wrong with this stupid thing? They don't realize there's a little bit of a learning curve to it. And it'd be good to, to mm -hmm. pay attention to who you're listening to. In this case, it's much easier than learning to ride a bicycle. But we, you know, in a research setting, we do have the opportunity to do things in a systematic way. And some of that is, is with technologies, but some of it also is just with experience and lots mm -hmm. of practice. And, and so we've reached a point now where we didn't expect there to be a public interest in this. You know, remember we're, we're accustomed to in the exercise world, the public oftentimes being resistant to adopt habitual behaviors that are good for them, especially if it's not seasoned and peppered with a little bit of, this is going to make you look great, you know, kind of thing. When you look at the Sully's push-up, what you're dealing with is something that seems rather boring. Your legs are under your desk, or in your case, if you were flying to Rome, and it's just sitting down on the floor and it's not bothering anybody. It's usually not seen by anybody. Most of the time we're sitting, people don't even, you're, you're alone. And you're, you're doing this uh, much like sitting in a rocking chair or something. You just, just do it. And so there's nothing sexy about that. And it's to improve human health. It's not glamorous. You know, if I like doing pull-ups and push-ups and lifting weights and doing all kinds of endurance training. But uh, some of that is I like it because, wow, look, you know, look what I can do kind of feeling. And it brings some, some motivation for that reason. With this, what's the point? <laughs> you know, it's, it's to improve your health. And despite all everything I just said, everything I said made me think that the public wasn't going to eat this up. Uh, it was going to be a good research tool. And surprisingly, I've never seen anything like this before, where from cultures all over the world, the number of YouTube videos and the number of tweets and the number of people who are trying to, on their own, you know, without any kind of guidelines or American Heart Association or whatever endorsing it. People are just single research study, basic science study that have decided, I want to do this. 
And so, you know, we've tried to, you know, in a, in a very feeble way, respond to that. We, you know, created a little website and we have created some videos slowly and certainly not, not in a uh, spectacular way, but more just to help people, guide people mm-hmm. along. And what are the fundamentals that you need to know how to do things? And it's been a remarkable response, like I said, from very diverse cultures, places in the world that you have a lot of problems going on. And you say the last thing they're going to be thinking about is controlling their blood insulin, and blood glucose, our lipoprotein metabolism, our inflammation and so on. They're going to be thinking about other things that are more pressing. And a lot of those countries are jumping on this. They say, well, one, it's free and I can do it anywhere, anytime. And, and so it's, it's, it is intriguing how it's, it's unplayed in the last uh, year. I'm sure. And it's a nice feeling that you've really captured people's attention and makes a positive influence. We'll include links to your website and the resources that you provide okay. online. So, Mark, this study we just discussed was very interesting, and there was a second study that also has generated lots of interest. Could you tell us about that study, how it was conducted, and what the findings were? After doing the first study, we saw that the muscle glycogen, that carbohydrate stored in muscle, wasn't the main fuel that was being used. And so we asked the question, we said, what would that mean for blood glucose regulation? It's important to point out something. Again, this is one of these, what I call sort of fundamental physiologic facts that's well worth knowing. And when you know it, it changes your perspective a lot on understanding of insulin and glucose metabolism. And it's one of those things that I would say is is not debatable, which is this, is that the amount of glucose that's in the blood or the extracellular space is quite small. We have about four grams of plasma glucose, five grams of blood glucose. So we're talking four calories per gram. So we're talking 15, 20 calories of fuel that's in the bloodstream due to this blood glucose. It's very important to remember that the difference between being diabetic and euglycemic, meaning good glucose, is about a twofold difference in your blood glucose concentration. So so the difference between a diabetic and a healthy person is less than 20 calories of blood glucose. So that's a small number. When we talk about 20 calories, you can you can burn that down quite quickly with Soli's push-ups, minutes, not hours. And so burning enough calories wasn't going to be the huge hurdle for us to jump over, but that's oftentimes missed. And I don't know of any other study, surprisingly, Mike Marcus might chime in here, but that I've looked for, can't find them, of what is the rate of carbohydrate oxidation that one needs to have to create a meaningful, meaning a large reduction in blood glucose in the postprandial period. So in other words, to prevent hyperglycemia and or, and or, they usually go together, reduce blood insulin concentration significantly. And I mean significantly, I don't mean statistically significant with a good p-value. I mean a meaningful magnitude of say 50% reductions. And so you say, well, how much do you need to actually increase the burning of this blood glucose? So energy glucose is a great fuel I don't, I don't even know of any other functions that blood glucose has other than to go into tissue and provide you a potential fuel. And so it's, so the body likes to use it as a fuel. So the question is, how much do we need to burn? And the second study was getting at that. And so we, we, we did a very simple mathematical prediction of it. And it was in that paper. We, we hypothesized from that, that you would need to burn about a hundred milligrams per minute of carbohydrate. And if you could sustain that, it would have a very large benefit on blood glucose and insulin regulation, 100 milligrams per minute. So, so we're talking you know, less than half a calorie a minute of carbohydrate oxidation. To put this in perspective, when you do whole body exercise, that large muscle mass stuff like you know, walking, running, weightlifting, people can easily burn 10 calories a minute entirely from carbohydrate, if, if, depending on who they are and so on. And when you're doing that, you're burning easily gram amounts of carbohydrate. So there's a huge difference between 100 milligrams per minute and what you get with large muscle. So it came down to us saying, if you could sustain carbohydrate oxidation by a muscle that isn't burning a lot of glycogen, that's point one. And two, that muscle has all of the molecular machinery for the, both the delivery and the extraction and the utilization of blood glucose, which the soleus has. There's special transporters, for example, that get glucose out of the blood. The soleus is rich in those, and there's signaling pathways that regulate this, and the soleus is rich in those. So we said it has these intrinsic properties. 
that could maybe you don't need to raise energy expenditure that much. And so we wanted to test that. So what we did was we took a group of people and we said, we're going to have them do the Soleus push-up, or we called it the SPU, the SPU activity again that we did in the first study. This time we're going to lower the intensity by one third or two thirds of the level of the first study. By lower the intensity, we're really pressing the, the envelope on this hypothesis of how high do you need to get carbohydrate oxidation. And secondly, by lowering the intensity, it means that you're better ensuring that you're not going to use glycogen as a fuel because we didn't biopsy the people in the second study. And so, so then when we did that, what we saw was that even this relatively modest intensity, the lowest intensity that we studied of this SPU activity, lowered the blood glucose profoundly and lowered the insulin even more. And so we're talking, you know, 50% reductions in this postprandial excursion. That's a whopper magnitude by any measurement, uh, in part because people don't quite realize that uh, we call this glucose tolerance, meaning that when you challenge somebody with a 75 gram glucose load and look at the glucose responses, glucose tolerance is actually harder to improve than most lay people understand. There are many very well-designed, very well-controlled studies that show that even, for example, weight loss doesn't necessarily improve glucose tolerance, even though it might improve measurements of insulin sensitivity as measured with sophisticated techniques like the euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp. It doesn't necessarily improve glucose tolerance. There's a very good exercise physiology literature that's looked at what happens in the hour or hours after intense exercise and kind of going back to Marcus's question about what happens to metabolism after exercise, there is a little bit of an increase in, in energy expenditure in that first hour after exercise. But if somebody is doing this high intensity training for that purpose, then they would be very pleased to know that that level is less than 10% of what you get with the Soleus push-up. But what we saw was that all these previous studies that were looking at glucose tolerance immediately after exercise, even hard exercise, were not improving glucose tolerance. And that's important in, in that there's actually mechanisms that explain it. And so I think that your listeners, for example, are probably attuned to something called the glycemic index or the idea that the amount of carbohydrate and the type of carbohydrate we eat has a big impact on glucose and insulin regulation. What they don't know probably is that in the hour or hours after exercise, it's as if the gut in your body is able to absorb glucose faster than if you never exercised. So let me say that in a, in a second way, it's meaning that, that the rate of glucose absorption is normally speeded up or sped up when we eat simple sugars compared to a complex carbohydrate. But that rate of a simple sugar is even sped up as a result of prior exercise. The idea teleologically is that it's, it's the body's way of fueling you saying, if you just exercise, we're going to make sure you get refueled well. So, so those things tend to work against glucose tolerance. And so, so exercise is really good for us for a lot of reasons, but th this post exercise recovery metabolism is not well suited for improving glucose tolerance. The other thing about this, and this kind of also answers Marcus's question in that post exercise period. There's not a single study in either animals or in humans that has shown that glucose oxidation is increased. So what that means is that while you can raise the energy expenditure a little bit, you don't raise the burning of carbohydrate and certainly not specifically blood glucose. It actually goes down a little bit. And so, so, so those things tend to counteract the ability of healthy exercise to improve glucose tolerance. It's hard to improve it. So weight loss, weight loss is not a good tool, unfortunately, for improving glucose tolerance. I know that sounds crazy to people because they say obesity is a cause of diabetes and so on. But there have been very well controlled studies. I'd be glad that we've referenced it in our discussion where they've done like serial, you know, steps where you will lose 5% of your body weight, 10%, 15%, and they come back and they repeat glucose tolerance and it doesn't improve in people. Even though when measured with a clamp, which is a more sophisticated technique for measuring insulin sensitivity, even though the clamp says you improve insulin sensitivity, you don't improve glucose tolerance. So my point in saying all that is that improving glucose tolerance is difficult by nutrition. Low-carb diets tend to actually make it worse, not better. I'm not saying low-carb diets aren't good for fat burning. It's just not great for burning blood glucose. The Soleus push-up, surprising to us, is very adept at burning blood glucose as a fuel, 
and it burns a sufficient amount, over 100 megs per minute, that we you know, can burn over 200 megs per minute, which was an ample amount to, to improve glucose tolerance. Then this is a key take-home point, too, is that it does so without stimulating these other counteractive processes that take place after large muscle mass, whole body exercise. And so, so it's as if the rest of your body doesn't sense that there's been this large physiologic disturbance. And therefore, the, it just says, yeah, the, the soleus muscle needs more fuel. I'm going to give it to it. And then the rest of the body, you're fine. I'm going to leave you alone. You know, And we don't see that after, after whole body exercise. The other point that we, we shared in the discussion was not a study of our own, but I think it's one of the most fascinating papers that helps to put all this in context is that they had people do one-legged exercise and it was good, hard one-legged exercise. For, I think it was a couple hours or something. And they, then they put these catheters in the leg and they were able to show that that leg extracts more blood glucose afterwards, as you would predict. Surprisingly, what they saw though, was that the other leg that had been resting took up less blood glucose than if you had never exercised, meaning it became insulin resistant. So whole body exercise is turning on lots of stuff systemically. And some of that stuff is counteracting improvement of insulin and glucose regulation. And the Solis push-up provides us a way of saying, let's turn on the good stuff, but no more than we need to. And let's leave the rest of the, the processes alone. And we can improve fat metabolism in the hours that blood glucose is not high. And we can improve blood glucose and insulin in the hours that, that you've eaten some carbohydrate. Mm. Well, thank you for such an interesting interview and discussion. I think we'll be hearing more about the Solius push-up. Yeah, again, Mark, thank you for the time, and this has been quite interesting. Um, and I'm sure your research team has new directions that it will go from here. I understand, though, as we wrap up today, that you're headed out for a hunting trip and uh, doing some bow hunting in deer season. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the, the uh, so this is, you know, I'm in Texas and, and it doesn't get real cold here, but we've had a little bit of a cold spell, which is a good, good news for us. So I'm, I'm currently sitting in a, about a 55 degree room enjoying myself. And so I will partake in, in the outdoors as much as I can. No, that's a lot of fun. Best of success and, and have a great trip. We appreciate uh, your time today. Well, I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk to both of you. Yes, thank you. It was wonderful. Thanks. STEM Talk. 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 Well, that was a fun and interesting conversation. It was indeed. The Solius push-up is quite interesting, and for many, it could be a game changer if applied properly and regularly. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Marcus Bauman for now, signing off. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.